We all thought, hey, maybe if we band together, uh, we'll be able to compete and get you know, some portion of the market in a world that, that IBM dominates. And, and so that was a motivating factor, both of the times that we uh, sat down and talked. The thing that makes it tough, though, is you get two different development sites. And if you have this vision of an operating system, a single operating system that's going to do everything, having those multiple sites and those different visions is tough. But I have to say it's, it's surprising that we never got together. There's a traditional Microsoft tactic. If you can't join them, beat them. Microsoft looked for a partner to line up against Novell. In the late 80s, in our frustration with Novell, we threw in, we 3Com threw in with Microsoft to unseat Novell in the networking software business. You know, we both went into it with a, a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of energy. I think we wound up having a business relationship that was cumbersome at best, a technical relationship that was a little bit difficult. And that enterprise met a horrible end uh, in the late 80s. A Ultimate, horrible end. A horrible end, ultimately leading to my departure from 3Com. The cause of Bob's horrible end is still a matter of dispute, but everyone now agrees that Microsoft and IBM had a falling out, and then so did Microsoft and 3Com. What Microsoft failed to tell us was that their relationship with IBM was falling apart at that moment, uh, which came as a big surprise about three days after we signed the deal. We eventually separated. I think there was good intent on both companies' part. I frankly, to this day, think we managed the thing very professionally. I know Metcalf has, has you know, some bitterness about it, but we were both properly looking after our business interests and properly both companies trying to be good partners. And then in 1989, uh, Microsoft announced OS2 Land Manager. And I can remember reading the headlines, OS2 Land Manager going to put the network operating system out of business. And they predicted by 1991, Microsoft would have 60% share of the network operating system market with OS2 Land Manager and said that Novell's share of the same market would drop to 25% by 1991. Well, by 1991, our share of 50% that we had in 1989 had grown to 75% and they still hadn't made a dent. So, When that product failed to take off to Microsoft's satisfaction, the middle level managers at the company there had to blame someone. They blamed us. And so uh, Microsoft double-crossed 3Com and went around us to our own customers with our own product. And uh, so 3Com went into a loss situation just long enough for the board of directors of 3Com to decide they needed a new change, a new management. When I complained to Microsoft about this, I said, why is it doing this? And uh, the guy involved, who I will not name, but the guy involved looked me straight in the eye and said, you made a mistake. You trusted us. <laughs> <laughs> the unique thing about software, which I had, had thought about you know, ever since the, uh, the mid-70s, is that software production is unlike ev any other production that preceded it. Again, no raw materials are required. No time is required and no effort is required. You can make a million copies of a piece of software instantaneously for free. And there's something unique about that. And I, I've, I, I kept you know, running it around in my mind thinking, oh, what can you do with this? What? It's, it's so unique, it's so unusual, nothing like it has ever appeared in the world before. And finally it came to me, aha, a new business paradigm. You just give it away because it doesn't cost anything. You simply charge for the update process. You get the copy free, you can use it as long as you want. If you want the updates, we'd be happy to give them to you for a nominal fee. And after we had five or ten million copies out there, it was a very simple process to turn the switch and begin charging for updates. There's this myth that Silicon Valley companies are always started in garages, but there are other options. The biggest company in the networking business, for example, was started in a living room in this house where Len Bozak and Sandy Lerner used to live. They were Stanford academics, but they were in different departments on different computer networks and unable to send email messages like, did you feed the cat? So they invented a way of networking networks with things called routers. The company they started in 1983, Cisco Systems, today does $10 billion a year in business. Routers created great wealth for the Cisco founders, Sandy Lerner and her former husband, Len Bozak. 
Len was a brilliant network technologist. Here he is, hard at work, in a snapshot from Sandy's Cisco scrapbook. It was do-it-yourself networking. If you wanted it, you had better do it yourself because no one else was going to do it for you. You couldn't buy it. We basically pulled wire through manholes. We pulled wire through disused sewer pipe. Um, we built a lot of things by ourselves. I mean, it was very, very much, a, at that point, a, a guerrilla action. We had no money, and we certainly didn't have any official sanction. Um, in the end, I guess the university was kind of allowed not to like it, but they did get a network out of it. On the digital highway, packets are blasting this way and that, going from network to network on the way to their ultimate destinations. At every point where one network is linked to another, there's a box called a router. Think of a router as a traffic cop. Like the cop, a router does three things. It stops traffic, it starts traffic, and it gives directions. So routers keep local packets from leaving their own network and clogging the internet. Internet packets they let go through and even give them directions to the next router. What routers don't do is eat donuts or give tickets. Len and Sandy left the company when it was worth a billion dollars. Today, Cisco Systems is worth $60 billion. In the intervening years, Cisco and its competitors went from steady to spectacular to incredible rates of growth, much of it fueled by the next great internet invention, the World Wide Web. And look what became of Len and Sandy's living room. Remember Excite? By March 1997, after three years, they'd gone from hacking code in a garage to become an internet media company. Revenues from advertising were into the millions, and they'd outgrown office number three. Time for another move. Three years ago, we visited with six kids in a garage working on their dream. Starting with $18,000 and a bag of brown rice, they built Excite into a company with 200 workers worth a quarter of a billion dollars. And this is just the start. It has to be, because in the world of internet business, the rule is grow or die. You see, we moved from the garage to the dining room. Uh -huh. We moved from the dining room to an office, about 5,000 square feet. We moved from that office to this office, about 12,000 square feet. And now we're moving to our final resting place. We're only two years into this huge revolution called the commercial use of the internet. We're only two years in. Think where other industries were just two years into their lives. Think where cars were two years into automobiles. Oh, well, they were terrible. I mean, bicycle wheels, a tiller for the steering wheel, a motor that took you at five miles an hour and died in about a half a mile. If you look back in history, past the scope of this program, past 1970, past 1900, back to when we were human beings in small tribes hunting and gathering. Everybody you had to deal with was somebody you saw every day. And we're a species that's based on communication with our entire tribe. And one thing that modern communication does is make it possible, again, for us to communicate with anybody in the world. Unlike the PC, it levers the top line. It helps us entertain and inform and educate and inspire and sell and make community, uh, even make meaning out of life and out of death. And, and, and that's a far more powerful dynamic than you know, cranking out memos and doing financial analyses with a spreadsheet. Think of this as uh, just a few milliseconds after the Big Bang. I mean, it, we only barely discern the fundamental laws of physics, the business models that are going to work. What better place for a Big Bang than CERN, the European Laboratory for Particle Research? Believe it or not, this is where the explosive growth of the Internet began. Here in Geneva, Switzerland, the next great internet breakthrough, the World Wide Web, was created by an English programmer named Tim Berners-Lee. There was always different sorts of people from different countries who brought different sorts of computing equipment. And so CERN was at the forefront of making gateways for file transfer exchange so that you could get files from different sorts of computer, email exchange so that you could get email from the proprietary systems to cross borders and go into uh, another proprietary system. And although I wasn't involved with that, that was the spirit. There was a lot of networking.